welcome welcome mr sering uh, you know it's so um, it is so so much of my privilege and honor that you accepted my invite and have given us your valuable time so i'm going to um, give it back to anshu khanna and then we'll have a chat later firstly i'd like to say that you belong to one of the most beautiful parts of uh, one of the most beautiful country in the world which i have been lucky enough to uh, uh, you know visit and i had a lovely time in uh, both paro and thimphu and we were i was researching on the way you have linked uh, the living cultures of religion and uh, met a your culture minister and it's a beautiful you're blessed to be born uh, in that country <laughs> yeah thank you so, yeah so you know your institute of happiness is doing ground breaking research in happiness which is a by product of peace there's no peace without happiness and vice versa you know you being a former politician the question is how can you play a vital role in the research of religion and peace ending the religious conflict once and for all i don't know whether it can end uh, once and for all but bhutan understands living cultures and links religion to uh, peace and everyday life so how do you think uh, your institute can make a change uh hi thank you i hope uh, everyone can hear me that's right we can great great thank you thank you for the warm welcome and this uh, great opportunity i think to be with all the speakers and especially rachna for reaching out and and uh, and also putting us all together uh from the institute uh, of happiness uh, in bhutan I mean, we are relatively a very small uh, group. At the same time, as my colleagues say, uh, with with uh, pretty big dreams, in the sense that uh, we feel that the small researches that we are conducting here uh, will have a far-reaching impact, uh, not only in Bhutan, but uh, as Anshu was saying, uh, we have the privilege of uh, being a unique uh, in a unique situation, unique country. Uh, led by a unique uh, leadership uh, or his majesty the king and um, and, and uh, even though very small in terms of population uh, but um, sorry i thought uh, there was some cross connection but anyway if you can hear me i'll just go ahead um so the um as anshu has uh, articulated i think the overall goal of really trying to reach peace and eliminate conflict uh, especially across religions and so on i think it's it's uh, it's rather ambitious but uh, taking a cue from uh, what we are doing at the ioh in bhutan is we have said that look um, the constitution the uh, democratic um, constitutional democratic monarchy uh the you know new system for bhutan has been very new uh we had the democratic election in 2008 um so we are trying to see that uh, how a small country like bhutan with a very very uh, traditional you know historical uh dates uh, going way back to thousands of years ago and then now we have these recent changes in democratic system how we are reconciling um or traditional uh, you know identity as well as the new role that we are assuming as we go forward and uh, that me has allowed us at the institute to look at what is the real vision that is inspiring the bhutanis to achieve as a state um to me as a former member of parliament um, i realized that the bhutanis as uh, i think rashna was earlier asking also what do the people really want so when the constitution of bhutan was adopted actually first thing is people of bhutan did not actually really want uh, uh, electoral uh, democracy <laughs> because they are saying you know if it's not if it's not broken why fix it you know so his majesty the king should uh, assume the absolute uh, monarch uh, power in the country and then let's not have this uh, democratic system where we are political bickering and uh, parties you know fighting among each other and uh, especially for a small country like bhutan so that is what the people indicated but uh, our king uh, fourth king really uh, insisted that you know the best thing for the country will be democracy so that's why then 
the constitution was drafted. So when you look at the constitution, the people have signed off through a major referendum saying that they want a GNH state as the ultimate goal for the nation. So the question is, what is the GNH state? Um, so this at the IOH, we have simplified to what we call the constitutional equation of GNH. So the constitutional equation of GNH has uh, three parameters, basically X, Y, and Z. So Z is the end goal that we are trying to achieve. And X and Y are the two inputs which will go into basically achieving that uh, end goal. So the end goal Z is what you call from tradition and culture and, and also our, uh, uh, in a way inspiration from religion, we find that the end goal state of DNH state is called what do we have the infinity and the boundless a boundless and immeasurable uh, three elements, no, four elements, sorry, four elements of boundless, immeasurable uh, elements, which is to do with uh, peace, compassion, joy, and kindness. So again, we realize that it's not only for Bhutan, but that is a, a universal human value system. Um, so this is the end goal that, um, that we are simplifying for, for Bhutan as a genius state from the research, from the institution. And the inputs are X and Y, so X, we are defining as the space parameter, which actually in the constitution is defined under article five, section three, as the 60% of the mandatory forest coverage that we have to retain. So that includes the four elements of nature in, uh, you know, for, for the society. And why is again, uh, article two, section uh, uh, six of the constitution, which defines the four life stages of these, people uh, in any society, especially in Bhutan. And that has to do with actually ultimately the time limit for any politicians and not only politicians, actually even for His Majesty the King. The article uh, two section six mentions that His Majesty the King also has to abdicate the throne by the age of 65 period. So there's no ambiguity, even an absolute monarch who has transitioned into a democratic monarchy will be abdicating the throne at the age of 65. And that fundamentally goes back into the four stages of life. So we defined um, in, at the Institute, uh, the constitutional equation, which says X and Y are the inputs which gives the ultimate goal and objective of Z, which is the genius state of compassionate society, uh, boundless, immeasurable love, kindness, and which is basically a human, universal human value. And this, by the way, is crafted by, of course, His Majesty, the fourth king. So we have the four elements of nature, four stages of life, achieving the four uh, boundless, immeasurable compassion, a JNA state crafted by the chief architect of the constitution, which is the fourth king. So again, the numerologically also, we sort of aligned that uh, the fourth king has drafted this constitution with, you know, four elements of nature, four elements of time, four stages, and achieving the, the ultimate JNA uh, state. So. Um, so again, this is just only a part of a small research we are doing. Uh, it is not a national uh, statement or, or neither it is a highly academic uh, finding. Uh, but I think uh, the exciting part is uh, for us to be able to share these uh, small things, which then we are able to reduce and relate to at the individual level. And then if in Bhutan, if it's a small society, if we can agree that the ultimate goal and the vision is the the compassionate and, and peaceful state. And how do we share that uh, with our colleagues in the region? And I think uh, that brings us to the larger question, even if it is across the religion uh, in Bhutan, we have, uh, it's a small country, but we are multi-ethnic, multi-religion, uh, multi-racial. Uh, uh, so we have actually a conglomeration of, uh, of the, uh, the, the diversity, the benefit as well as the challenges that comes along with uh, with a huge, huge country, uh, even like Nepal, India, and, and Pakistan. Um, even more so in Bhutan, I think for a small country now, the question for us is, I think if we can um, really uh, document and also either through anthropological studies or through social studies, uh, if we can really share these experiences, then perhaps uh, this is something which we can validate I, all the honorable speakers, uh, for example, you know, with what you're doing and your access to, I'm sure, a tremendous amount of resources, both in terms of academic as well as research institutes, uh, then perhaps I think there are a lot of things we can share. So for now, let me just uh, leave it at that. So from the Institute of Happiness, 
we are coming out with a very, very simple, in fact, it is a reductionist uh, theory saying that how can you reduce the entire constitution of Bhutan, which is uh, 35 articles and 353 sections, just three articles uh, basically to do with the JNH and state input is X and Y. And people are, sometimes people are laughing at it. Oh, how can you do that? But we, we are saying that, look, uh, when we are faced with so many options, uh, we don't have the uh, luxury of dealing with so many multivariable inputs and multivariable uh, elements and factors. Because then that gives us total confusion in terms of which are the option we should really choose. So for IOH, we are... Uh, we have chosen these three parameters, which we hope that uh, I think in due course of time, we will be happy to share with uh, all the colleagues here or, or uh, simple uh, constitutional equation of the gross national happiness. So I hope that this will be in some ways allow us to debate and discuss, so which will ultimately then, uh, it does cut across religion because the uh, the, the infinite and boundless measurement of uh, peace and happiness is not confined to one religion. It's not confined to one uh, nation. It's not confined to one racial or ethnic group. It is a purely a universal human values and ethos. And, and I don't think there's any problem for us in, in really agreeing on that. Yes, Kinga, so thank, and, I want to, and I want to jump on that before Anshu goes another one. I was about to say, well, it leads us to confusion and you took those words of mine because, um, you know, when you talk about constitution, a normal person doesn't understand it, right? Uh, but a normal person is the one who is fundamentally creating that nation. Nation is made of people. So constitution is for people. If people don't understand, I mean, you know, like you just said, I don't know, 35 articles, 35 subtitles and all of that. People don't understand that. Make it simple. And if you are doing that, I would I would be all there to support and help. And I would also say that, um, you know, why only for Bhutan? Please do it for India. Please do it. Do the research for the entire region. Or, or like, let's say, you know, recommend like top five, top seven constitutional reforms and say that this is what we really need in this region. And go and meet all of these leaders across, and we are there to help you and support you because this is what we need. We need we need simpler content. We need something that people understand, that people relate, and then people can work for. Back to Anshu. So, uh, uh, I really love what you spoke about, and I was uh, I had the good fortune of reading a lot about gross happiness index and how Bhutan uh, measures it uh, in an economic kind of uh, perspective. You have spoken a lot about the constitution and sh shrinking your thoughts and your laws and everything. But how do you link it? Uh, how do you think it's different from what the government is already doing? And uh, how do you link it to economics? Uh, thanks, thanks Anshu for the question. Um, I, the, what the government is uh, primarily doing is, you know, at the policy at a much larger policy level, at the 30,000 feet level. Hmm. And what I, which we are trying to do is actually, how do you relate something that's up at the 30,000 feet level to your day-to-day -day life experiences and aspiration? I think this goes back to what uh, Rachna was saying, you know, constitution, of course, is something that is um, I mean, that is the supreme law for every nation. But at the same time, uh, what is the use if ordinary people, uh, you know, like us uh, or our colleagues back in the villages, they, they don't understand. Uh, that is a big problem because uh, through the procedure, especially in Bhutan, uh, I remember back in 2006 and 7, uh, His Majesty, the current king, as well as His Majesty, the, the fourth king, they have been personally traveling around the entire nation to explain to the people what is the benefit of the constitution, what are some of the, you know, critical causes mentioned in the constitution. Um, so, so in Bhutan, uh, we are happy that at least um, this, you know, exhaustive uh, process has been carried out by uh, none other than, you know, His Majesty the King and the fourth King. Um, so people are, uh, in a way, well informed. But at the same time, me as a member of parliament, I mean, for me to comprehensively fathom and understand the 353 section is impossible. How can I expect 
uh, you know, our colleague in the village to understand that. Um, so this is the difference that I feel that we are making uh, even to our institution. So the government is mainly looking at the process and the planning system um, and looking at, uh, there are, of course, we have come out with a multi-criteria analysis. So if you have to propose a project, then the project goes through a multi-criteria analysis where one of the filters and the lenses is that of GNH lenses. So how do you tie uh, every single project or every plan of the government back to the achievement of a GNH state? And that is still a work in progress. Um, I think my colleagues in the government would agree that we haven't perfected the system, but at least it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. And, uh, uh, and, and I think uh, the, the Center for Bhutan Studies is doing an excellent job. So now, at the Institute of Happiness, what we are doing is uh, uh, taking on from whatever the government is doing. For example, the government has launched what we call the GNH for Business uh, uh, Index. And that is something which we are hoping that through the Institute, we can in fact uh, translate it into a little bit of uh, some operation, uh, operational uh, practice so that we can provide the feedback. So we are working with uh, one uh, university in Spain called the IE University in Madrid. So uh, we have been guiding some students there who have now come out with a corporate social responsibility framework based on the GNH uh, business uh, uh, index. Um, so, uh, so that is something which we feel that role that we can supplement and complement with what the government is doing. So for example, if somebody wants to reach out uh, from outside, for example, say uh, one of uh, our colleagues here would like to reach out to the government. Um, the one thing is that you know they will not have any time. Uh, on the other hand, I feel that through our institute, we are able to relate more with what's happening in, in other parts of the South region and get to at least establish this personal ties and network. So that is the other thing. I don't think, you know, uh, uh, government with, uh, with their hands full, they will be able to, to actually come down to our level where we are now discussing some fascinating uh, experiences across the, across the South region. And, and, and to me, I think, uh, make it really accessible for all of us. That is the role that we are playing at the IOH here in Bhutan. Uh, a role that is, you know, uh, really, really necessary because at the government level, uh, they, they do not have the time and, uh, and the breath to, to really get into these uh, nitty gritty things, which is actually absolutely important. Great. Um, you know, you spoke about students going uh, to the European countries to search. However, Bhutan is part of the SARC uh, region. Uh, would you think it would help if uh, there was a student exchange within this region to understand peace, happiness, prosperity, and uh, decipher the issues uh, in a peaceful manner? And do you think Institute of Happiness would like to get involved in that? Absolutely, Anshu. I think uh, we are already having a large, uh, especially, <clears throat> I don't know, for Bhutan, uh, given our size, we have... Uh, uh, as of now, I think uh, close to, I mean, pandemic has uh, disrupted a little bit. But otherwise, we used to have about 500 or 600 students in India. Uh, Nepal, maybe not that much. But in terms of uh, monks who are studying in the monasteries, Nepal also uh, used to have uh, close to two to 300 Bhutanese who are studying in the uh, Shechen Monastery and, and so many other uh, monasteries in Nepal and Kathmandu. Uh, Sri Lanka, we have uh, currently, I think, uh, about 70 medical students who are studying in Colombo as well as, I think, some of the regional medical schools in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, Maldives, I don't think we have. Uh, uh, Pakistan, I don't think uh, we have. So, so we already have a huge, uh, long tradition of uh, Bhutanese uh, students uh, going out to the South region and studying a lot and then bringing back uh, this close network of friends and, and you know, regional uh, sharing of, I think, really the region, not only universal, but regional values. Um, for example, I remember as a young student when I went to the US uh, for my engineering, uh, you know, as soon as you get there, um, the best way to get rid of your homesickness is get together with your friends from India, Pakistan, and then start eating roti and dal, and you know. So, uh, so I think um, uh, it is, it's really fascinating. Uh, you, you'll be surprised the moment we meet 
in US or Europe, all the challenges and differences within the South region disappears. Um, so, uh, so I think it's to do with um, uh, the larger, larger jigsaw puzzle, the environment, the pressure from the society, the pressure, the political pressure, and also the pressure from, uh, in some ways, sometimes the tribal uh, nature that, uh, you know, unfortunately comes out in us, uh, that, is, uh, that is impeding the progress towards a regional peace. But uh, to take out the Indian, take out the Bhutanese, take out the Sri Lankan from India, Bhutan, and uh, Sri Lanka, and, and send them to US, they are among the best of the friends, I'm telling you. That's true. Yeah, I, I really hope we are best of. We could be best of the friends here as well because you know that is the core issue of border. You know, we would save so much of money in uh, and be able to allocate that money in uh, looking after our children, our healthcare, and so does that bother you as a piece? Uh, I'm sure. And sure also I want to I want to add to Kinga and add some uh, you know fun in the session because it's a very serious discussion. Um, uh, Kinga, I think we agree that when we go abroad, we don't get that much power. <laughs> this region does not get that much power. And precisely why we should come together, isn't that a big reason? Um, mm. What is it? <laughs> That's why they come together because they're like, no, no, bye bye. You know, suddenly they are bye bye because they they are getting ignored um this might be might be uh, really like shooting it sharp but that's exactly what the truth is and we are here to find the truth of this region only then we can find a solution right so back for yeah. those who think it's a joke yeah. you can you can smile for those who think it's a serious <laughs> they can really think about how do you really um it's called um in a way, um, racism. So, uh -huh. I've given you a good thought here. I've given you a good thought here. Back mm -hmm. to Anshu. No, no, so I agree with you completely. We have kids who our kids have studied overseas and they keep talking about it in a very, 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 very subtle way. But anyway, what I wanted to ask you is, a, you know, the practice <laughs> of peace, do you think it would be a better idea to mediate rather than spend uh, so many dollars in uh, border conflict and divert that money towards uh, fighting poverty. And how do you think uh, the South nations can achieve that? Uh, I think um, uh, I know. I mean, every like every uh, question, uh, even in this forum, is highly complex. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the exciting part is how do you reduce that complexity and. Uh, Acknowledging the complexity will always be there, but uh, uh, but if you don't reduce it, then you know, then 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 you not really get the the momentum as well. So in terms of, I think um, the disproportionate attention on the as you are saying the border uh, defense and and conflict, um, I th I think um, part of the thing is we need to. Uh, you know, again, in a small way, I'm not saying that this uh, could, be, could be achieved, but if we can reframe the entire uh, gaming theory between uh, uh, the communities, between the societies, or between the nations, to a situation where we really, uh, you know, where we really discuss and agree on the shared uh, common values and purposes, uh, again, it may sound like a cliche, but but to me, I mean, it always reminds me of the fascinating uh, experiment uh, they did with the, with some of the mice, um, right? I mean, you know, they let them play oh. uh, big mice and the small the small rats and the small mice. Uh, but so the, initially, the big, big rats were mice were really bullying the small mice. So the small mice then, in some way, they realized that they, hey, look, this is really unethical, you know. Uh, I mean, they need us also to play with them so that if they want to enjoy the game. So then they realized they, the small mice, they started uh, looting and they didn't play. And then the big, big mice then slowly came around and sort of in a way apologetically, then they said, okay, sorry guys, you know, now we are not going to be rough anymore, you know, <laughs> because we need you to, to play along. So I think, I think it's a normative, uh, fundamental, ethical uh, issue that we need to reduce everything to. 
and mm. and and agree that you know let's be transparent about everything um so i think if we can come to some kind of a, a agreement and in that sense then i think that will take care of uh, one part being the expenditure on being belligerent expenditure on the arms race uh, because that's just a gaming theory and it's not a fundamental uh, ethical you know negotiation that you are carrying out with the, with the other group so i hope that we can learn something from this mice experiment uh, uh, fascinating but at the same time you know it, it's it's so true at every level um, um, so, so let's let's look at that and and i think um, um, uh, in in the research and the uh, talk that I'm sharing now is also we are saying that look uh, the GNH leadership framework from Bhutan is in some ways an answer to the global tragedy of of the commons. So when you look at the global level, so not only arms race, uh, I mean COP26 has just taken place. So looking at the entire gamut of climate change uh, challenges, and this is really the the manifestation of global tragedy of the common. And I don't think, uh, especially, uh, you know, we have the uh, countries who are not able to participate for understandable understandable reasons. Um, so that global tragedy of commons through our institute, we are uh, bringing it down at, uh, to in, in Bhutan and at the community level. And then uh, finally, we have zoomed into one very popular saying in Bhutan, which says that uh, Mangelamo, I, I, I know I, all of you have understood that right now. <laughs> uh, what it means is that when you plow the community field, sometimes you will break your plow share. And that is something which you should not forget. And it's, it's absolutely okay to, to break your own personal plow share if the benefit is for the community's field. Um, so, so again, you know, uh, it, it goes down to zooming into some of the archetype stories that we share in the communities, and then how do we uh, then then you know translate it to uh, even at the education system and even at the diplomatic level. So you know, interestingly, you spoke about the climate change and the recent convention, and you know there has been you know most of the nations have run into globalization whereas Bhutan has remained like a little oasis you know and not been an hurry and it's reflected in the way your you know your your the balance of ecology is uh, stronger in your country you know so do you think that oasis theory has helped Bhutan and secondly you know um the other thing, you know, peaceful nations globally, the five, top five peaceful nations, their GDP has grown faster than the last five. So do you think peace, climate change, slow growth, there's a method in this madness? Well, I, I think so. I think there is, a, I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, SDG goals, out of the 17 goals, we were saying that um, uh, actually, Except one of the goals, all the other 16 goals have already been actually uh, defined as the key uh, index indices and parameters in the GNH uh, Growth National Happiness uh, uh, Development uh, uh, Framework. Hmm. Um, so if you ask, oh, what is that? What is that one goal which is missing? And it's to do with water and ocean, because Bhutan is a mountainous country. We do not have water and ocean. Um, but to your point, I think. Uh, uh, sometimes people pitch GDP versus GNH. So they're saying, oh, Bhutan is GNH, so therefore you're not GDP. And again, again, this is not at the, at the larger government official view, but my personal view and our institute view is that GDP and GH, GNH is not at, uh, you know, they're not opposite of the spectrum. Uh, we, I argue that GDP is a subsect of the GNH. Um, so, so GDP is very much there. I think this is 100 years old paradigm, 100 years old, uh, uh, you know, uh, formula that has been now, uh, I mean, uh, it's still there. Every country is using it. So we do not want, to, I mean, especially from the Institute, we do not want to deny GDP. GDP is very much there. Uh, but what we are arguing is GDP is part of the GNH system. So now the overall larger umbrella of GNH has to look at how do you value the other aspects. So then we get into the externalities, then we can get into the market value of everything. 
then we go back into Michael uh, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, Robert Kennedy's famous speech in 1968. By the way, I, I found out it was at the University of Kansas, which was my alma mater. Um, so, so I think then you can sort of, you know, correlate to so many initiatives which has taken, uh, which has actually, uh, you know, been going around the world, but it was only His Majesty, the fourth king of Bhutan, who has really articulated with precision so that everybody is able to come together and say, oh, wow, JNH. and um, So we are not perfect yet, but uh, uh, let me clarify that we are not denying GDP. Um, I mean, you need to put food on the table, you need to put food on the table. Uh, you need a car to drive around, you need a car to drive around. But at what cost? And I think that is the ultimate uh, matrix that we are using to uh, define, you know. And, and if you look at the constitution of Bhutan, I think, again, Article 14 goes into trade, commerce, uh, and then article goes into the state policy. And the, these articles will also have the uh, element of uh, sometimes capitalist market. They also have elements of a socialist uh, welfare system. Um, so, um, so I think um, uh, we do not want to, again, especially from our institute, we do not want to uh, deny GDP. GDP is absolutely required. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, we need to make a stand of where you want to be at the spectrum. If it is a total free market and total socialism, we tend to believe that ours is uh, not, not the middle path. Again, mixed mix is a dangerous signal because then you don't know actually where you are, you know. But ours, I would like to believe, is a, a JNS system which in the spectrum, you can look at maybe what five percent towards the towards the GDP and capitalism because we do need to encourage private sector enterprise. We do need to encourage innovation, um, and that I think is the hallmark of a democratic system as well. Um, so let me uh, let me leave it at that. Yeah. No, great, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we can see this the calm and the smile on people of Bhutan, and I think that is uh, the biggest indication of gross happiness. So you spoke about mice. So I want to know, how do you think the mice of Sark, our political leaders, can actually create what the European Union is able to create? And lastly, what Furo, you know, organizations like Furo are talking about innovating uh, innovative ideas. What would you like to uh, advise uh, Rachna? Like, uh, how can they innovate to ensure political peace actually happens and it doesn't remain a pipe dream? Thank you. Um, so let me first uh, let me first answer the the second question on Puro. Uh, you know. I think we owe that to Rashna and Furo for organizing this excellent uh, seminar. Um, I think Furo is doing a wonderful job. Um, and uh, but not only that, I think Furo has already demonstrated the innovation part uh, because um, uh, of course I think Rashna has been to HBS. So I'm sure there's the entrepreneurial uh, spirit and you know, all the discussions she has had and in, in, you know, uh, Baker Hall or wherever, uh, but um, I think for Furo now as a as a as an innovative um, uh, key agent, uh, and but that also in a very complex uh, uh, space uh, such as uh, politics and peace, um, uh, Furo has to Furo has to not only continue doing what uh, what they are doing, but also do something which. They know for sure because innovation is experimentation. Experimentation means 97% failure. So for Furo now, the question is, uh, would Furo be, be bold enough to go ahead, uh, chart this, 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 you know, trailblaze this path with the concept of uh, innovation and experimentation, so which ultimately means being ready to fail, being ready to take this huge risk and, and I, I believe Furo can, not only because Rachna is leading, of course, that's the main thing, right? <laughs> but also because- so we, know you're doing something... we, have, we have 
Priya. See, whenever you introduce yourself and your organization, you always talk about the success, right? Mm. But we have failed. It's mm. been six years. We have experimented and experimented. And before getting given this name, Puro Innovations, we did a lot of things um, on ground. We, run, we ran campaigns and we did uh, some programs, national, international, cross-border. We've done a lot of things. We've failed. And that's why we've learned. Um, and that failure has shaped us to what you see today on uh, Zoom. And I think it's pretty much uh, a signal for Furo to um, continue, like you said. And thank you for just for encouraging that. Um, that we need to continue because persistence is something that's the key. And, you know, also getting people like you. Now, who knows? I mean, this idea of shrinking the constitution and making it, and like you said, the tragedy of the common, making it something which is useful for the commoner is sad. I mean, no one has actually thought like that. I, no, we couldn't, maybe perhaps we had like little idea, but we didn't know how to articulate it. Now, see, awareness is everything. So once you start building awareness, then... All, all I can say is that you have to support people, organizations like us, and um, we're there to, in turn, continue innovating this space. Yes. So on that yeah. note, uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I think he was to he was to answer the first question. Answer He's the advice question. Advice the advice uh -huh. leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you okay, think um, guys can become like tigers? <laughs> well, uh, I, <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, it's, as, as somebody said, I think, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, black mice, white mice, uh, or a red mice, as far as, yeah. you know, it's a good mice, <laughs> uh, I think we should acknowledge it. So I think the issue is not, uh, not so much to, to, to you know, uh, become from mice to tiger, but I think all of us, if we can... Uh, really get the inspiration from the mice experiment. Um, the world leaders uh, for me is um, uh, the, the the appeal is really trying to to, uh, to ration, not not rationalize, but I think uh, this is another thing that from the institute we are sharing now the framework on the model of what you call the tip of the iceberg. So what you can see is actually only the ten percent. What you can't see underneath is the ninety percent uh, uh, underneath the surface. So I think every society, every everybody, the universal human uh, value and aspect is that uh, what you discuss, what you talk, what you know, your knowledge, uh, all the technological development, everything is the tip of the iceberg. But who you really are, 90% which is underneath the surface is your values, your culture, your habits, your attitude, your position. And that is actually what is driving us. Um, uh, but we all imagine that, you know, the tail is wagging the dog, which is 10% we feel is wagging us. Whereas the fundamental truth is that 90% is actually who we are. Um, so my appeal to all the world leaders would be at this point to acknowledge that. Acknowledge that 90% of who we are is part of our DNA. This has been handed down to us, uh, you know, I don't know, 6 million years ago from the chimpanzee yeah. all the way to now. Absolutely. And this is what is handed over to us through our religion. This is what is handed over to us through our communities, uh, back to our ancestors, back to the stories that we hear, back to the folk tales that we uh, discuss about. And most important thing, back to the gossips that we always listen around the corners. Um, so given that the world leaders, as I think our uh, friend from Nepal was earlier mentioning, instead of giving the political speeches, giving the uh, grand talks, uh, fundamentally, acknowledge we are 90% of uh, who we are is underneath the surface, which is same for everybody uh, in, in, in the world. And whether the religion is different or whether your ethnicity is different, but we are normatively the human universal values the same. So if they can reduce everything down to who we are and, and acknowledge that, and I feel that that would put them in a better position to uh, then, you know, pick and choose the policies, pick and choose what agenda that they can you know want to talk about uh, when they sit across the table? Um, so yeah, so please reduce everything, make complex issues to simple issues, and and I think the world is going to be a much better place. Yeah, 
And who know, who knows better who we are than people of Bhutan, where every house looks the same, where young children are taught how to. Let's go to Bhutan. We take a delegation to Bhutan. Yes. I'd love to. You should do your Kinga's first experiment on all of that simplifying the regions problem should be on us. We are ready to come there and learn from. Yeah, I'd um, love yes. to record that.